Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we have a special guest who's going to talk to us about a special topic. I'm sure it's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, but before that, a few comments. As you know, we take an opportunity every morning on Grand Rounds to discuss special figures or special events that really change the way we think about medicine, biology, healthcare in general. So I want to remind you today about Thomas Sydenham, and I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's considered the English physician known as the English Hippocrates. He was one of the first involved in this concept of clinical medicine. He was very engaged in, in, in emphasizing the idea that you have to observe carefully at the bedside, that you have to take careful notes. Um, so he was born on this day, but while practicing in London, he was um, very uh, involved in the treatment of gout, and he wrote about gout. He named scarlet fever. He differentiated from measles. He was the first, one of the first to use iron in the treatment of iron deficiency anemia, and he helped popularize the use of quinine for the treatment of malaria. Thomas Sydenham. About a century later, on this day, 1713, John Nidham was born. And John Turberville Nidham was an English clergyman, the first clergyman who was a Roman Catholic priest to be entered into or accepted into the Royal uh, Society of London. And he was very interested in spontaneous generation of life. And the reason he was interested in that is because he would boil soup inside these glass jars, cap them, come back a few days and investigate what's in there and found things in there, organisms that were alive. And he assumed, concluded, that there must be spontaneous generation of life. Remember, this is in the 1700s. It took two or three decades later for a guy called Spallanzani to say, no, there's some spores that can survive boiling for a few minutes, and that's what you're seeing over there. 1700s. But today I want to remind us about Emily du Châtelet, uh, must be killing that name, but Emily du Châtelet. And she died on this day giving birth to her child in 1749. She was a French mathematician and physicist. A woman, Emily, French mathematician and physicist in the 1700s, also happened to be the mistress of Voltaire and was very well known because she loved scientific discussions and the philosophy of Newton. And she was the one who actually transcribed into French the Newton's Principia. And for many years, that was the only version you could read in French of Newton's Principia. Voltaire actually wrote the preface in that book. It was interesting to me because in the 1700s, there were not that many women who were recognized as mathematicians and physicists. And to be able to participate in discussions of science of the day, she had to dress as a man to be able to walk into the cafes, to be able to listen to the brightest minds of the day. Would you think about that today and think about how it relates to our topic? And with that, I'll introduce Dr. Barbara Casper, Chief of the Division of Internal Medicine, who's going to introduce our special guest. Good morning. I'm very happy to be able to introduce this morning's Grain Round speaker, Dr. Henry Ng. Um, had a lovely dinner with him last night and so got to know a lot about his goals and, and what he's trying to accomplish. He completed his undergraduate and medical school training at Michigan State University, followed by MedPeds training at the Metro, Metro Health System in Cleveland, Ohio, where he also was a chief resident. He subsequently completed an MPH at Case Western, where he's currently an assistant professor of medicine. Dr. Ng has been, had a commitment to the treatment of LGBT patients throughout his career and has been instrumental in developing Pride Clinic, the first hospital-based LGBT serv health service line not only in Ohio but in the nation. He currently continues to serve as the clinical director there. He has been the recipient of numerous awards for his work with his population as well as his excellent teaching skills. He served on the safety committee for the International Federation of Gay Games and is currently the president of GLMA, a national committee committed to the LGBT advocacy and equality for LGBT patients and health professionals. Dr. Ng has published extensively in this field and has been an invited speaker both nationally and internationally on this topic, and we are very fortunate he chose to join us today for our Grand Rounds talk. 
At a time when celebrities are helping to bring more awareness to the transgender people, most physicians feel really ill-prepared to be able to provide the appropriate and sensitive health care that our patients deserve. And I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Henry Ng, who will speak today on the incorporation of transgender care into everyday primary care. Dr. Ng. Well, thank you so much for, for having me here and inviting me to your lovely city in Louisville. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to talk more about transgender health and what things we all can do to improve uh, the type of health care that transgender people receive both here in this city and across the nation. And you know, I'm going to start with just, uh, this is an audience poll. I know we don't have a lot of, uh, of uh, response uh, uh, clickers and things like that for, for this morning's talk. So I'll, I'll just have you kind of think to yourself. Um, so think about the, your response that you'd have about these statements. I, or at my clinical site, I currently provide, or my site provides the following service or services for transgender patients. A way to indicate someone's preferred name. A mechanism to indicate a preferred pronoun. Gender neutral or unisex restrooms. Cross-gender or gender affirmation hormone therapy. Transgender experience mental health. Either co-located or somewhere we can refer. Referral for facial feminization surgery, top surgery, meaning mastectomy, breast augmentation, chest reconstruction, bottom surgery, any type of either reconstructive surgery or deconstructive surgery, oophorectomy, hysterectomy, penectomy, vaginectomy, orchiectomy, motoidioplasty, many, many others. Legal or other assistance for name change, gender marker change. I don't serve any transgender patients, or I'd like to serve transgender patients, but I don't currently. A lot of us are probably down at, you know, choices H and 11. Some of us might be doing some of the things listed above. But frankly, when you're providing health care services for transgender people, it's not just focused on hormonal care. It's not just focused on surgical care. It's focused on the totality of caring for a human, a human being, an individual who has all these different types of experiences and their different social determinants that affect their health. So this ends up actually being the reality of the kind of care that we offer for transgender people. For me, barriers to providing transgender health care include, well, I, I don't know what services are important. I just simply hadn't learned them in medical school or nursing school, PA school, social work school. A lack of institutional support. I have not been trained. I'm concerned about insurance coverage. Will I get paid? Can I drop a bill? How do I code for these things? Um, I'm concerned about medical liability. Will my patients sue me? Will I do harm if I don't have sufficient training or expertise in this area? How do I minimize that? How do I mitigate that? I don't know about the resources in my community. Where could I send somebody for mental health services? Where could I send somebody for a consultation about any aspect of their health if they're transgender? Um, I'm concerned about creating a new set of problems. This is the Pandora's box experience. Are we really ready as an organization? Are we really ready as a practice or a group to address this issue and do it right and do it well? And again, I don't serve any transgender patients. So um, there are my disclosures, no financial relationships, anything that we're going to talk about today in terms of hormone care are not FDA approved at this time and considered off-label. And hopefully you guys at the end of this talk will be able to you know, enhance your ability to deliver transgender health services in primary care settings um, by recognizing different types of resources that are available to you in your own local community, as well as different resources that are available in terms of educational guidelines and best practices, where to look for evidence-based information, and also be able to identify the various social, eologic, psychological, factors that impact health for transgender individuals, as well as be able to describe the basic uh, 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 aspects of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression as constructs, and then think about ways how you can apply these ideas and constructs to your daily practice. We're going to try and use a case discussion uh, model with a couple of real cases of real people at the end. Um, at their people from based on our center where we see adult, adolescent, and pediatric patients and we give comprehensive care for hormonal management, mental health, primary care, um, and post-surgical care concerns. Of course, we've adjusted things to respect a patient's privacy and HIPAA. And um, we're going to talk about some basic transgender 101. Okay? 
So we're going to focus on areas of both cultural competence, how do you talk to people, what are important things to understand when we're talking about sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, that these things are actually different but related, and talk about how we can address an affirming environment of care because you can certainly have one or two individuals who might be very skilled in delivering that type of care, but if your entire team is not well aligned, you may have some challenges and problems in patient satisfaction. And then we'll talk about clinical competence in terms of different types of care protocols and best care resources that are available for you, and try to walk through some of these in a couple of illustrative cases and hopefully have enough time for a couple of lessons learned and also some Q&A. So we'll start with a review of constructs of sexuality. For some of you, this will be a review. For some of you, this is not. Um, so there are four constructs. We're going to start with sex. Sex is determined oftentimes at birth. We assign sex based on the genitalia that are seen, the physical characteristics that are seen at the time that a baby is delivered. And typically, this is done by assessing the presence of genitalia that are typical for male, having penis in the scrotum and testes, or having a vagina and a vulva and assigning that as female. For individuals who have indeterminate characteristics or a combination of both characteristics, they may have an intersex condition or maybe DSD affected, they have a disorder of sexual uh, development, and that it may be not possible to assign sex at that time. So additional studies may be performed. So we may perform a karyotype. Additionally, this will also address individuals who may have uh, a uh, a difference in their uh, overall sexual development. So they have primary amenorrhea, and we find out that at age 16 that someone who is female presenting and female appearing actually doesn't have a uterus, and that actually they have a condition like androgen insensitivity syndrome. So these are things that we'll think about when we talk about biologic sex. So that's, this, again, the symbol between the, the legs here, with a male, female, and then a combination of male and female. Gender identity, this is frankly you know, a, a, a very easy construct to think about. This is how you identify yourself when you close your eyes and how you see yourself. You, most people see themselves in a very binary way. I see myself as masculine. I see myself as feminine. Not everyone sees themselves that way, though, especially with uh, younger patients that we see who are non-gender conforming or gender fluid. So for those folks who see themselves in an in-between state of having some characteristics of maleness and femaleness, they will put a lot of different words to describe what that uh, state is. For this particular slide, the infographic uses the word genderqueer. However, that's not the only word. You can see queer, you can see many, many different words that might be in that middle space. And again, just because you're in the middle space doesn't mean those things are equal. You can be in one end of a spectrum or the other end of the spectrum, and it's perfectly fine. Gender expression. Gender expression is the way that you show the outside world how you see yourself, or sometimes not, because perhaps the environment that you're in is an environment that isn't fully supportive of your gender expression. For example, you may be living in an environment or a community that is particularly conservative, and it's actually not safe for you to express your gender identity by dressing feminine in a feminine way. Okay? If you are otherwise feminine identified, but you were, if you had sex assigned at birth as male. Anyone recognize this child in the photo? If you do, raise your hand. Hi. So a handful of you guys. All right. Who is it? It's Jazz. Although this is like a really old picture of Jazz. Jazz is now, what, 16, 17, something like that. And I think she's like the fresh face of CoverGirl or ClearSell or something like that. So Jazz is a transgender girl and was a YouTube sensation, and it also spoke to what it was like, what it is like to be transgender, to do that very in a very articulate way as a young child. So we'll see gender identity sometimes um, be evidenced during childhood, during adolescence, and for some individuals, they've had these feelings and constructs and ideas and schemas that they can finally apply during late adolescence, early adulthood, and realize, oh gosh, you know what? These feelings I've had that I haven't really been able to categorize, now I get it. I used to think there were feelings of attraction, but actually these are feelings that have to do more with my identity. And, okay. Oh, I'll we'll move, we'll move my head down and move the mic up. Is that better? All right, thank you. So, you know, so certainly individuals can present their, themselves in a way that's both that's either feminine, masculine, combination of the two as an androgynous presentation, be one, where, uh, be one uh, down the, the spectrum on one side or another. 
And then finally, sexual orientation has to do with who you're attracted to. With my teenagers, I talk about this is who you want to kiss as opposed to who you want to be. So do you want to kiss Beyonce or would you like to be Beyonce? <laughs> okay, that's kind of a, a very practical example of how to sort out you know, sexual orientation versus gender identity. All right? So your emotional, physical, erotic attractions toward other individuals. And again, these terms don't always apply to people who identify as transgender. They tend to be very binary. So individuals who are trans and are attracted to people of many different orientations or many different bodies, they will just say, you know, I'm, I'm who I am. I'm attracted to who I love. I'm attracted to whoever I want to be with. So recognize that terms like homosexual, gay, bisexual may not always apply, especially when we're talking about transgender populations of people. So this is all summed up in the infographic of Gender Person, uh, gender person 2.0. And also, you can see a different version of it here in a non-binary way with the gender unicorn. I have to have things with unicorns and rainbows in my slides. All right. So with those constructs, now we can talk a little bit about creating a welcoming environment of care. Because part of our, our work in providing um, healthcare services that are affirming and respectful for sexual and gender minority people is to make sure that not only do folks understand the constructs and are then able to communicate with our patients in an effective way, but we also create environments where they're able to do this well. But we don't do this well. So uh, I actually became, I, I like to use social media. I do use Twitter, I tweet. And I became aware of this tweet from Parker Malloy. It's really small, I know you can't read it, so I'm gonna read it for you, and this, it'll be reproduced on the slides better. Um, but the slide says, um, Park Malloy is a trans-identified person and says, there was this time I had to take a pregnancy test before getting a chest x-ray despite lacking a uterus. Trans health failed. <laughs> so what we're seeing is that people, patients, are taking to the Twitterverse to describe what we do well and what we do poorly. And in fact, what we're seeing is that the Twitterverse is filling up with what we do poorly, not what we do well. I have yet to see trans health success, trans health wins, trans health awesome. I'm seeing a lot of negative things that tell us that as a healthcare system, as healthcare professionals, we still have a lot of work to go. So a couple of these more, let's say, nurse, when was your last period? Me? Trans Never. I'm transgender. Nurse, you really fooled me. I thought you were a woman. And the next one, I'm sorry, I don't specialize in transgenders, but I hear you can find that online. Trans health fail. <laughs> I saw a specialist psychologist for an ADHD assessment who asked about my surgical status. Trans health fail. A nurse tried to call me back to my appointment and then shouted, that can't be you. The chart says male. Trans health fail. My hormone doctor recently dumped me because they're overwhelmed with patients and they can't handle them all. Trans health fail. So there's still a lot of different types of barriers that we have, both in the front of the house in our clinics and also in the back of the house where we can still do a lot of work to improve the, the experience that transgender people have in healthcare. So for the front of the house, I mean, part of our goal is to be able to talk about training, and this is important for all of us, that we're able to assess what patients want to be called. So in our clinics, one of the things that we do is we have a little paper form that's a, used in addition to our uh, registration process, and we're able to get a better sense of what pronoun a patient would like to have used for themselves. So sometimes they'll choose binary pronouns like he, him, his, she, her, hers. Or sometimes they'll use gender neutral pronouns. They'll either use z, zir, ziv, or they'll use they, them, there as a singular. That's evolving. And most recently we've seen Mr., Ms., and Mix as being used as prefixes to identify individuals, especially for those who are gender nonconforming or non-binary individuals. So you know, these are options and shows that, gosh, if we have these options and tools, and what's your preferred name? If we offer these things for our patients to self-identify, then they'll tell us what they want to be called. And we can refer to them in the correct way. And all team members can do that, from the person who's doing the registration, to the, the person who's the MTA or medical assistant, to the nurse who's getting the vital signs and asking the chief complaint and the reason for visit, for us as providers, and every single handoff that we have, because these are handoffs of information and the handoffs are correct. It is not only harmful emotionally for patients to be misgendered and, and dead named, meaning using a name that is not their name of choice and may actually be a name that they don't need legally to use anymore. Okay, but it is a, it is a harm for them. 
it causes significant psychological harm and humiliation for our patients. And our patients are actually beginning to become more savvy and report this through um, bug person's offices and make clinical complaints. And this is where this affects us again because our Prescani scores and our patient satisfaction will be affected by all the ways that we care for our patients. It behooves us to use these tools and use these skills to be able to correctly identify our patients. In fact, I do this with all my patients, this trans or otherwise. Hi, I'm Dr. Ring. how are you today? How would you like to be called? How would you like to be addressed? A couple of my patients ask me, well, why do you do that? Because I want to get your name right. I want to respect who you are, simple as that. All patients deserve that. So additional things that we need to think about um, are the environment of care, both the physical environment and the electronic environment. A lot of electronic health records at this time, unfortunately, do not include fields for the collection of data for sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. They collect that for sex. And certainly we can put in this additional information in other fields as necessary, but they're not the standard demographic fields. This is a challenge for, of course, patient studies, but also it doesn't help us identify who's trans and when these additional things like field names and preferred name might be really important. So our patients get to be lost sometimes in that. So if we want to be able to address these issues, we have to think about the EHR. And unfortunately, I've, I've seen the, um, the latest uh, comments on meaningful use uh, stage three, and there is no movement at this time, at least from the federal government, to say that it will be necessary or mandatory to collect sexual orientation or gender identity data although the health IT division of HHS has moved forward to at least create some ways and options and recommendations that we could do that. So it's optional but not mandatory at this point. You also can think about your physical plant and your physical environment. Where's the washroom? Where's the restroom? Where's the bathroom? As opposed to where's the men's room or where's the women's room? Um, my, the residents and the faculty that I work with and our patients know in, in our facility that my pet peeve is calling it the restroom. You go to the restroom to rest, the bathroom to bathe, the washroom to wash. You don't go to the men's room to man or the woman's room to woman. <laughs> All right? We should call it what it is. And where can people go to use the restroom safely, privately, confidentially, comfortably? All right? So, you know, we have different ways that we can try to think about doing this by getting intake forms. And some, unfortunately, they're kind of workarounds at this point, but the workarounds do help. Um, identifying relationship status, preferred name, informed consent. Um, these are things that we provide for our patients, including FAQs, frequently asked questions about clinic and what to expect if you're going to have an initial visit and you're looking at initiating cross-gender hormonal therapy, um, common medications and how to deliver uh, these medications. So all patients get a packet at the end of the first visit so that they'll be able to review this information of resources for them and then address these um, at their subsequent visit. And we have a, a ton of learners too. We're um, full of, uh, our clinics are generally full with medical students, residents, MPH students, nursing students, PA students, um, you name it. And we're happy to be able to support that education because you need to be able to practice the hands-on skills as well as being able just to talk about these types of issues in a didactic lecture. Now, we, we do this version of a lecture about an hour and a half long first, and then we'll actually have them come to clinic. So that's all kind of cultural competency. Like, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of setting the stage and making sure that all staff, including the providers, are on point in terms of their clinical competency and their cultural competency. We'll talk about the clinical competency next. So there are standards of care, and these have been established for a number of years, and they've gone through a, a number of iterations of revisions. Um, the World Professional Tr Association of Transgender Health has a uh, large set of recommendations. It was last uh, revised in 2011, and it's uh, made up of a group of international health experts and specialists, including people who are transgender themselves. Um, and it, for those of us who do this work, you certainly can both become a member, and they're offering for the first time a transgender health certification course that's going to be offered this November in Chicago for about two days. I think it offers 18 to 20 some odd CME. So for those of you who actually might be interested, that could be an option for you to attend. Um, the Endocrine Society also has its 2009 recommendations that, from my understanding, are being revised um, at this point with recommendations about the care of transsexual people. And what I want to point out is that you know, there was a big shift that happened between 2000 to 2011 to now. So that period for a decade, 2001 to 2011, and onward. 
The traditional model that was discussed and, and talked about previously was what's called a triadic model. A triadic meaning three. But it also implied that there were three phases and that people had to progress through these three phases in order to truly be transgender and to complete their training, or rather, complete their care. So there was this assignment of a diagnosis like gender identity disorder, transsexualism, or one of these other types of DSM diagnoses from DSM-3, 4, or now 5, gender dysphoria, um, and then that they were required to have what was considered real-life experience. We now call this more of a kind of social transitioning. You're presenting your living as the person that you want to be. However, that was mandatory and required prior to hormonal therapy for the period of time before 2011. If you didn't do that or couldn't demonstrate that you did that well for whatever reason, you were not considered a candidate for cross-gender hormonal therapy or surgical care. Once you did that, then you could obtain letters of support or reference from a PhD level sex sexologist or specialist, because there's so many of them all throughout the United States, and it's really easy to get these letters. And you need to get at least one letter if you were thinking about starting cross-gender hormonal therapy, and you need to get two letters if you're thinking about any type of surgery. And the letters needed to state that basically, you are not crazy, you are still trans, and yes, you are a good candidate for these therapies, and you know that they're otherwise medically necessary, life-changing, and potentially irreversible, depending on the kind of therapy that it is really easy for most of our patients to get throughout the country. I'm being facetious. So now we've shifted to an informed consent model. In the informed consent model, um, there, there are references at the end of the, of the slides, but you could, for example, go to the Health um, Equality Index, or the HEI, um, which is a program of the human rights campaign that evaluates health centers around the United States, and their best practice examples of informed consent forms that are used to initiate or maintain cross-gender hormonal therapy. The Fenway Institute in Boston also has some really great examples. We actually used one of theirs and adapted it so that we could use it with both adolescents and adults. And the alternative model now talks about using other diagnoses like gender dysphoria or sometimes you know, diagnoses like endocrine disorder not otherwise specified. Well, why endocrine disorder, NOS? Well, there are a lot of us who work in this field who feel very strongly that we're treating an endocrine condition as opposed to a mental health condition because this gender dysphoria is the only mental health condition that we know of that's being treated with surgery and hormones as opposed to psychotherapy and mental health medications. It's a little bit of a mismatch. There's still controversy about that. However, one of the prevailing practices is to use that diagnosis. And mental health is certainly encouraged for both adults and adolescents in terms of obtaining care. And we're going to focus on the care on adults, um, but is not necessarily a requisite. Certainly, if you have individuals who are experiencing a moderate to severe untreated mental health concerns, access one, access two disorders, mood disorders, substance abuse, thought disorders, those issues need to be addressed prior to the initiation of hormonal therapy or surgical therapy in order to have the best health outcome possible. But they are not necessarily a reason to not include somebody for those types of care. Real life experience is not required. And finally, prescription for medication and treatment can be done after an evaluation and obtaining the informed consent. So the interventions that we're going to talk about today are framed in three ways. Um, they're fully reversible ones, um, which are generally um, not choices that you're going to be using for um, the adult patients that you have. They're usually used for younger adolescents, um, ages about 11 to 13, as individuals are going through sexual maturity rating stage two, the first appearance of breast buds and or scrotal enlargement and pubic hair. That's typically when we're going to consider using um, some form of GnRH blocker. Um, otherwise, we're talking about the initiation of both partially reversible interventions, that's aka hormonal medications, and then irreversible uh, treatments are generally considered as surgeries. So, you know, our approach to clinical care that we've used is informed consent model um, for those 18 and above, parental consent with patient assent for those 16 to 18, because we are also seeing pediatric patients. At our center, we do individualized care for those age under 16 with the full involvement of the patients, their families, and the gender team that we've assembled with a pediatric psychologist, endocrinologist, myself as a gender specialist, and other specialists and primary care folks as appropriate. But the initial visit we talk about with a lot of our patients is about getting to know you. A lot of patients will have extreme dysphoria or fear about what's going to happen to them at the first visit. You're going to undress me. You're going to make a fool out of me. 
I'm going to be ridiculed. I'll be humiliated. I'll be looked at. I'll be prodded and poked. I'll be experimented on. These are all things that our patients have told us that have been fears of theirs. So we do try to allay some of their fears by, by going through, in the first visit, what are your goals of care? What would you like to accomplish? Where do you see yourself in five years from now? What future do you have for yourself? Sometimes we find out that they don't see a future for themselves, and that's a big problem in and of itself, and we need to address that. And that sometimes will involve mental health services. But we'll obtain a health history. We'll perform a general exam. Um, a lot of our patients will be coming from other corners of, of the state. They'll travel three to four hours away, up to a third of my patients. So we're also a destination clinic. So I'm also mindful of when they come to clinic that maybe I need to do a little bit more rather than a little bit less. But at the same time, I'll negotiate with them. Are you in a place today where if I recommend doing a general examination or chest examination as part of your full evaluation that we're okay doing that? If not, can we defer that to the next visit? We'll review your labs. We'll draw labs today, and then we'll talk about completing that before we start hormonal medications at their next visit. We'll give them the informed consent form, the trans health packet with all the information they mentioned, and then referrals if they're pediatric patients. So the thorough history and exam includes a personal and family history of cerebral vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, diabetes, dyslipidemia, and hypertension, kind of the, the important metabolic concerns that could be impacted by starting hormonal therapy. We'll um, review any um, uh, risk factors for hepatitis, polyphysis, um, venothromboembolic phenomenon, both individuals as well as family histories. Um, if they've used hormonal medications um, before in the past, whether it's been prescribed or medically unmonitored, I prefer say medically unmonitored as opposed to street use, although I know people will use that term, but using those terms, for example, street use does tend to ghettoize experience and is, a, uh, is a, not the most effective way to describe that. Um, I ask about a history of silicone injection use because some individuals may have had a uh, silicone injection to parts of their body, the breasts, the buttocks, the hips, the face, the lips, in order to change their appearance. Uh, mental health history and screening is very, very important. Rates of anxiety, depression, PTS, polysubstance abuse may be high in certain subpopulations of transgender individuals, especially amongst those who have participated in survival sex in the past because they have not been able to have gainful employment. So tools like the GAD-7, PHQ-9, and other types of screening tools for mental health may be very helpful for you. So, you know, at the return visit, we tend to review the labs, and I'll tell you what those are in the next slide. Um, we'll complete any exams as appropriate. We'll review the informed consent forms, and we'll answer all questions. We're going to talking about you know, how the hormonal medications will impact sexual health and sexual function, how they will potentially affect reproduction, do we need to still talk about prevention of pregnancy with our patients? Our patients may part, I, I talk to my patients about their sexual health and sexual practices. If I have a trans man who sex assigned at birth was female, the organs that they have are a vagina, a uterus, and ovaries. I, I ask them, well, with your relationships that you have and your partner or partners, is there any possibility that you're going to partner with someone who has a penis? Because if you do, then if any exposure with sperm to your eggs, even if you're on testosterone, there's a theoretical chance that you could become pregnant. Do we need to talk about pregnancy prevention for you? Is that important? Does that make sense? Some of our patients will say, absolutely not. I don't plan on doing that. That's fine. If that changes, I need to be able to talk to you about that, though. Okay? Now, these are sometimes very sensitive and less than comfortable conversations for us to have. As health professionals, we are a little... Uh, uncomfortable generally talking about sexuality with our patients, and these are kind of the 301, 401 questions to have to address. So let's go through a couple of cases. And oh, actually, did I look? Oh, okay, the, the, the rest of this comes up like, in the next couple slides. Um, so this is the clinical case of Michael. Michael came to me because he was always in pain and everything hurt all over. And he was a 33 year old trans guy had a history of fibromyalgia, recurrent tachycardia, obesity, long-standing pain of all over the place, had been rejected by health professionals, both for being trans and for being drug-seeking for his pain um, from multiple clinics, uh, both uh, in, in Cleveland and other places where he had lived. He also had experienced a good amount of misgendering and had negative previous experiences. At one point, he had a MRSA, um, soft tissue infection of his forearms, and he ended up um, becoming septic, and during the, the hospital stay and the ICU and on the floors, he experienced a lot of, of misgendering and, and difficult care from the providers. So he, he was a fraidy cat, so to speak. 
You know, he was very leery of health professionals and how he would be perceived and how he would be treated. Um, so he initially, we saw him in an LGBT dedicated space in our pride clinic because that's where he felt most comfortable. Over time, this evolved. You know, he sees me in my primary care practice when in a non-dedicated LGBT health space because it's convenient. Okay. He'd been on testosterone, a therapeutic dose is off and on, but when I saw him, he was not taking it. We were able to resume that care on, without any incident, so we put him on 50 milligrams of testosterone sapionate intramuscularly weekly, and then we titrated him to 90 uh, milligrams weekly with good results. And we'd perform routine lab testing, which ended up being unremarkable. And like, again, I'll show you what that is. So with masculinization therapy, we typically want to use the testosterone, and we have a couple of options using to, uh, either topicals or injection. Um, injection IM versus sub-Q. There's been at least one study with Joe Olson showing that sub-Q injections of testosterone are not inferior and do not have any um, significant increase in um, complications or side effects compared to intramuscular injections. And this was done on a cohort of about 100 plus teenagers in San Francisco. Typical doses that are used um, are 50 to 100 milligrams IM weekly and or 100 to 200 milligrams every two weeks. A lot of us will end up titrating these doses up and increasing them. The Endocrine Society actually has a range that are used for pediatric patients, and we've kind of adapted that for our adult patients. We tend to start at like 30 or 40 milligrams and then increase as appropriate um, every three to six months. Um, there's also topical applications that you can use. The challenges with topical applications is that they can certainly rub off and uh, that masculinize other individuals who may not want to have that happen to them. Um, some of the therapy effects that are desired include fat mass re uh, uh, redistribution, muscle mass increase, a male hair pattern, decreasing voice, and decreased size of any breast tissue, and amenorrhea that may happen anywhere one to four to six months afterward. Some individuals will experience a good amount of acne, um, you know, whether it's a secondary polycythemia or erythrocytosis um, may occur, although if you look at references for men as opposed to females, then this tends to normalize. Um, there are concerns about cardiovascular risk as you may increase LDL and decrease HDL for some of these individuals or unmask diabetes and hypertension, which we've also seen in clinic. There can be mood changes and effects, including um, increased aggression um, that may happen long before any body changes actually occur. So I tell my patients oftentimes that, you know, this is kind of your test dose medication. I'm starting a lower dose for the first three months. We're going to do this low and slow like barbecue. No response. Okay. I'm in Louisville. So, well, this is actually what I say. We do this low and slow, just like barbecue, because we want to initiate the puberty that you should have gone through, but you didn't go through. We tend to actually have some additional challenges if we start in doses that are a little too high. If that happens, what happens to testosterone in the body if it's really high? Medical students. I hear whispers. I still hear whispers. Aromatase, right? Aromatase enzyme will be able to... Very good. So, and then if you have conversion of testosterone back into estrogen, that doesn't try to, you know, really do very good work for your trans man who then all of a sudden begins to have menstrual periods again or dysfunctional uterine bleeding or breast tenderness. Not so much. Not helpful. Here's the medical monitoring part. So there are multiple protocols that are, um, that are in the literature that are available through the UCSF website. Um, which is the Center of Excellence for Transgender Healthcare through the University of California in San Francisco. Um, and we always remind people to use the reference tests for the desired sex or gender. Um, but we're looking at a CBC with diff for anemia or polycythemia, BMP for renal function, and any um, elevation of fasting glucose for diabetes. You may want to do A1C as well, especially in those who may be obese. Um, LFTs because of hormone metabolism through cytochrome P450 thyroid function with a TSH, a prolactin for hyperprolactinemia and prolactinoma, a full lipid panel including LDL if the patient is not fasting, estradiol levels and testosterone total. And again, levels may vary depending on patient adherence to medication, dose used. I recommend generally for hormonal injection use um, for patients who are across hormonal therapy through uh, injections to actually measure trough values so that you're able to ensure that at the lowest level that that's still therapeutic. And you're, again, you're going to be looking at um, goals of having estrogen um, for trans men 
less than 100, less than 55 if possible, and that you have testosterone for trans men somewhere in the natal range, anywhere from 220 up to 900 or so, um, but probably lower than 900 if you're getting a trough. Uh, for trans women, the goal is anywhere between generally 1 to 200 or so. Again, uh, trans women are oftentimes taking oral medications, um, so they're not going to cycle per se. If they're doing injections weekly or biweekly, they may. And again, if you're doing injectable medications, you'll want to perform trough values. Um, recommendation is to perform lab testing every three to six months for a year and then yearly afterward. You may modify hormonal care dosage based on a number of additional factors. Again, this is expert opinion. This is not yet um, evidence-based because these studies have yet to be performed in terms of hormonal use and aging um, with those with a lower body mass. Um, there are unknown long-term effects on cardiovascular health and bone health, and this is definitely an area of interest that I have, but we're going to look at uh, metabolic bone disease and the risk for uh, some degree of either partial hypogonadism during the initiation of hormonal therapy and long-term. Um, caution in smokers because of the increased risk for venothromboembolic disease and cerebrovascular disease and cardiovascular disease. So back to Michael. You know, we explored his issue of chronic pain. He actually brought up, is it possible I have ehlers and I'm like, Really? You, you thought about that? I thought that was amazing. I was like, this is great. My, my patient's really participating in this care. And I, and at first I brushed it off, and I thought, oh, is it possible? Now, actually, this is changing my practice. He was morbidly obese at the time, and he, his body habitus hid his hyperflexibility. He had it. So as you remember, Ehlers-Danlos is a hypermobility syndrome. You can get chronic pain from unstable joints and arthritis and chronic muscle strain. It affects all joints of the body. And you have the Baton criteria in order to describe this with you know, hyperflexibility of your pinkies and your thumb and hyperextension of your arms and your legs and then palming the floor. There are your nine points. He had all nine. So here's your Baton scale again. And this is what he can do. And if you actually look, you can see where he had previous scarring from his wound, he had the scar spread, which is another one of the typical skin findings. He had had this tachycardia too that was trying to sort out what was going on. He ended up having POTS, which was part of the syndrome as well. I was just making sure that he didn't otherwise have abnormal cardiac function. So he got an echo. He got a lot of the stuff that we would have done. So we found a reason for him to have pain. We started him on medication for pain, including long-acting narcotics with short-acting breakthrough. And he went from being disabled to now working as a graphic designer. And he's been employed doing this work now for the last year and a half. So, you know, we, we were able to address actually more his medical issues that were more important. And the hormonal care was actually much, much less important. It was a part of who he was. But it wasn't the, the primary reason for his visit. Now we get to meet his partner, who first came as Paul and said, oh, I'm gay. I'm happy to be with Michael. And we've been in this relationship for a long, long time. And we're all happy and everything's all good. And then a few visits down the line, Paul says, I want, to be, I want you to be my doctor and take care of me. He said, oh, that's fine. We addressed some issues of hypertension, obesity, dyslipidemia, found out that he actually had new onset diabetes, got the medications going. And then finally, maybe about the third or fourth visit, so this is in the first year, he says, you know, I've always thought that I would actually was trans too. I thought, really? You guys have more stuff going on than I could possibly had imagined. But again, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. This was reality. So I had, you know, what previously may have been described as a gay male couple with a trans man and a cis man, now with a trans man and evolving trans woman. And those are the issues that we ended up addressing and walking Maria through. So Maria, we said, when we examined her, she was obese. She was doing okay. She explained, explained that she had some gender fluid identity um, and that she was interested in exploring being feminine. But at the same time, we identified a number of medical conditions to address first. So those were the things we did for her before we began these other things. But then, you know, we at some point um, later on, about nine or 12 months, began um, cross-gender hormonal therapy for her also after initiating hormone, uh, a informed consent process. So for estrogen, you're going to use anywhere from two to eight milligrams of estradiol acetate, PO. Um, you can also use transdermal formulations. We typically will use antiandrogen, and the general one of choice is spironolactone, anywhere from 50 to 200 milligrams. Some, place, some people use up to 300. I like to use less because of the risk for hyperkalemia. Um, there is a direct effect of suppression of testosterone by the use of spironolactone. Um, you can also use finasteride and dutesseride as a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. However, this only blocks a peripheral conversion 
of T to DHT. So this only will affect hair growth. This is not going to actually cause any significant suppression of the body. If you have a patient who can't otherwise tolerate spinalactone for a medical reason, you can use uh, uh, dutasteride or finasteride or whatnot, but you may not be able to drive down the testosterone levels very well, and you may end up needing to um, recommend them to have a orchiectomy. And remember always to ask about silicone injection use. There can be de devastating effects of this from both direct embolism, bacterial infections, HIV for sharps. These are often performed by individuals who are not healthcare professionals. They happen in many cities across the United States. I heard about this for the first time over a decade ago, and I thought, gosh, this is only New York and L.A. No, it's everywhere. It happens in Cleveland. It happens in Pittsburgh. I'm sure it's happening to some degree in every community. And you can also have autoimmune phenomena with lupus-like symptoms. You can have local tissue fibrosis and destruction and silicon migration and cosmetic appearance. And we've seen a number of individuals highlighted on TV shows like Botch too that have experiences like this. So if you um, have folks who are on cross-gender hormonal therapy on uh, estrogen, they're going to experience, again, fat redistribution, softer skin, hair growth, breast growth. They're going to experience nipple tenderness first, and then they'll experience greater growth. Um, some other changes will occur with decreased muscle mass, anemia, again, metabolic effects. There's a risk for osteopenia that we're not sure about right now. And some individuals may experience prostatitis in the very beginning. Um, generally, the initiation of cross-gender hormonal therapy is pretty safe. Um, Goren, who's one of the major researchers um, out of the Netherlands and um, has written in 2008 that the com complication rates of a study that was a very heterogeneous study of trans men and women um, who had undergone hormonal therapy and then surgical therapy, so they were in a hypogonadal state otherwise, they all did really, really well. The main measures of uh, outcome were morbidity, mortality data of all kinds, and also risk of osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease. And what they found was mortality was no higher than the comparison group of their general population. Um, the studies in the past have also looked at the complications of using estrogens, but the comparisons have been made with ethanyl estradiol, which is not the type of uh, uh, estradiol that we use typically at this point because uh, it's known to be more venothromboembolic inducing. Um, and there have been a low number of endocrine related cancers observed in case series of female to male transsexual people. The most important thing I want to point out is usually venothromboembolism is the most common uh, complication across general hormonal therapy and a uh, review and then analysis that was done just last year by uh, Asherman et al. So again, the recommendations have been to avoid ethanyl estradiol. Transdermal estrogen tends to have the lowest risk of venothromboembolism, although it can still happen. Um, most of us will prescribe oral estrogens at a lower dose range. Um, we can also offer uh, primary conjugated equine estrogens. Um, what we'll oftentimes tell patients is that if they're undergoing any type of planned surgery, um, for those of you who are going to take care of transgender patients on the wards, if there's a risk of immobility or PE or, or DVT, you probably want to recommend for them to come off of medication for at least a week and then resume a week afterward. Your patients may be resistant to this, and that's understandable. However, you should explain to them that the risk of venothromboembolism is quite high, especially in, in patient setting. Um, there are also biometric changes associated with cross-sex hormonal treatment. In a uh, small study that was done by Maddie Deutsch, she found that for transgender women who were undergoing um, estrogen therapy with or without antiandrogens, that there was a modest reduction of systolic and diastolic blood pressures, and among uh, lipids were otherwise unchanged on transgender men. Testosterone therapy was associated with an increase in BMI, but then again, med medically that doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot because they were overweight to begin with. This is a challenge overall for us after we've learned how to do all these things because you know, diagnosis billing is, is always challenging. Like I mentioned, that one of the uh, diagnoses that we tend to use will be endocrine disorder. This is a decision that you'll really have to discuss with your patients. Um, I found that most insurance companies have had uh, no additional benefit for my patients in getting medications covered by using one diagnosis over another. Most uh, public health insurances to this time still exclude cross-gender hormonal therapy, although the new interpretation of Section 1557 by, uh, of the Affordable Care Act um, by the Obama administration is looking at whether or not this actually can still occur. It may become illegal, but for the moment, this is still the case. So, you know, this is part of our challenge of getting the healthcare services covered and delivered to our patients. 
And I mentioned again, our EHRs are very challenging for us because they are gender binary. They do not have a lot of options for us. Although in a JAMIA article that was published in 2013, it highlights that there are a lot of different fields and uh, things that could be added or turned on in terms of enhancing the capability of our health records to capture important information for transgender and transsexual people including an anatomic inventory so that you know what organs a patient has so that we know what to screen and we know what to evaluate regardless of sex assigned at birth or the gender identity or gender expression. So back to Michael and Maria. You know, Michael ultimately was happy for Maria that she was self-actualized as a woman and really wasn't surprised by the disclosure, but did struggle some degree with Maria's feminization. Uh, Maria did have less libido with estrogen treatment. This is a challenge for Michael's own identity as a gay man who is transgender and had now partnered with a trans woman. It triggered some depressive symptoms that we worked through. Um, otherwise, they're actually both doing really, really well at now. Maria's disclosed that she's transgender at work to her students where she teaches vocational health courses and to her family and has been really well received. Um, there's a nice table that's provided by um, uh, Norm Spack in the management of transgenderism from his article that, well, again, will list out the typical medications and doses that are used um, in cross-gender hormonal therapy for trans patients. A couple other resources for you that I do recommend are include Trans Body, Trans Selves, a resource for the trans community written by the trans community, um, including health experts, and it's modeled after our bodies ourselves. And you know, certainly for us in our clinic, we've learned that you know, trust takes time, but if you're willing to learn the skills, train individuals in a small scale, eventually it grows, and patients tell each other, and all of a sudden you have a large group. So we've been doing our work now since 2007, and I have several hundred transgender patients who I follow throughout the state of Ohio, and I have one of the largest transgender practices in our state. And my practice does not overlap our endocrinology practice. And the needs that our patients will raise are very diverse from primary care, mental health, hormonal, surgical care, and all types of coordination of all these types of things. And that we have to be practical and sometimes create workarounds where we identify that we have barriers. And we also have to be able to provide training for all members of our staff and faculty who are involved in the care of transgender people in order for that care to be effective and to be respectful. So I have a few resources for transgender health, and why don't I just stop here, because I think we're probably getting close to out of time, and if I can entertain a question or two, that would be great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I mean, I, it's an area that we don't hear much about, and that brings me to my first question, mm -hmm. and that is related to medical education. It's this is another specialty care. We have patients who go to pulmonary hypertension clinic, sure. to cystic fibrosis clinic, and this is an area that deserves its own specialty care. Where you have an expert who can take care of you. How do I develop those experts? When part of the problem initially mm -hmm. is that fear of both the doctor right. and the patient of having too many people in the room, right. of having to be observed, watched, questioned. Mm -hmm. um, how do I get my students involved in understanding this so that we have the next generation mm -hmm. of our teams out there helping the population? Please make so more. How do, you, how do you deal with this? Uh, our experience has been to empower our patients in the education process. So one of the things that our, our, um, our registration intake form now includes was this little spiel that I used to give all of the, the patients. I just realized I just need to write this down so they can read it. It's much easier to say, Welcome to Metro Health Medical Center. This is a research and a teaching hospital. We see patients from all backgrounds, and we have learners all the time. Our learners may want to participate in your care so that they can learn to be better physicians, nurses, whomever, for all different patients, including the LGBT community. Would you like to have a, patient, a learner involved in your care today? Checkbox, X, Y, or no. And this first gives our, our patients a chance to opt in or opt out of that training. In the beginning, I was really afraid that, well, maybe they're all going to opt out. Actually, over time, they all opt in. I, I would tell them and talk to them initially. Sometimes they didn't want to have a trainee, especially for the first visit, because they were unfamiliar with the kind of care that we offer. And in fact, there's always like the first clinic visit for somebody, right? Um, but as patients are established, they realize that in order to have these types of services other places, that's important to have an opportunity to tell their story. So I encourage them to tell their story to the students and trainees. And they have an opportunity to correct them or step in as that happens. 
but I also assured them and let them know that the students and trainees that we have rotating through clinic have had additional training and skills in terms of both clinical competency and cultural competency prior to coming to clinic. So we've had a lecture or two. We've had an opportunity to sit down and talk about their experience caring for sexual and gender minority patients, including trans patients. But marrying the service with education and then the actual practice of those skills I think is critically important because otherwise you know, you can, we can read as much as we want to about various different types of guidelines and recommendations, but we feel very uncomfortable and uncertain until we actually have them in real practice. Question. Let's start here. So the you repeat the question? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So the question is, you know, uh, what is the prevalence of gender nonconforming transgender and transgender people <coughs> in the universe of the United States? Um, so the the number that's that's been described, at least from the Lumen sixty two um, projections, are around point three percent of only the US population. Perhaps the world population. But if we think about that we have 300 million people in the United States, 0.3% is a lot of people. That's actually higher than most orphan diseases. If we think about the individuals who are affected with this type of care, I think about the patients that I care for in my practice, not just the, the, um, the trans patients, but all my LGBT patients. We have over 1,000 unique patients that we see in our practice. That's larger than we would have for most orphan diseases. You know, it's bigger than some CF centers. So 0.3 percent. Questions? I'm just curious, how did you choose your training? How did you be able to advise the rest of Great tech. Great question. So that's actually a really awesome question. Not everyone was on board with me in the beginning, and that's okay. I had to learn how to kind of rock with uh, and roll with resistance, as we talk about in motivational interviewing. So I recognize that People have their own different types of experiences and beliefs, and my, my goal is not to change anyone's core belief system. You either want to do this because you think it's the right thing and you think it's appropriate, and, uh, or you don't. So we had maybe two people who expressed a desire to opt out and they didn't want to be part of the, the team. So that was fine. So we first found out after we uh, said we want to have a clinic, we create a performa, so there's a business plan around it. We did a community assessment to find out what the needs of the, cl of the clinic should be from the communities itself. They named the clinic, so the community called it Pride Clinic. And then we decided, okay, well, now we need to train people. Who wants to work? So we had a broad call on one of the sites, and we found out who was willing to work in terms of the nursing staff, the medical staff, the PSR staff, the patient service representatives, all those folks. And Whoever was willing to work, we went through a site training, and then we started seeing patients, and guess what? Eventually, everyone wanted to work in clinic because it was fun. We have a lot of fun in clinic. It's amazing how much fun we have in clinic, and it's amazing how good everyone feels at the end of the day. Actually, at the end of the night, because we have an evening clinic. So we go from 4.30 to 8.30, 9 o'clock at night on a Wednesday. And folks really love working there. And then they started jostling each other. Hey, do you want to work with it? Oh, I don't want to work. I, let me take your spot instead. So then we were able to have more than one person doing these various functions trained in doing this work. Although I've had staff working with me in this clinic for the last eight years and they haven't changed. A great question. Question. I, tell me just, just a few minutes before we, and then we'll let everybody go about biology. And, and okay. the reason is we use biology to understand. I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm not approaching biology here to intervene. I'm approaching biology to understand. You've mentioned that this is an endocrinologic condition. Mm -hmm. What is known about the understanding of the brain of, of identity? Well, we're learning more. Tough, it, it's a hard question. They're, they're, I think the, the, from, our, from my review of the literature, I think Simon LeVay's uh, studies have been um, some of the central and earlier studies that looked at of uh, anatomic and functional brain differences in transgender men and women compared to cis men and cis women, and that there are subtle differences in certain structures like the corpus callosum that appear to be thicker and more connected in trans individuals, um, uh, specifically, if I remember correctly, trans women um, than, say, men or women. The trans women's brains appeared more to be in that regard, just where the corpus callosum, similar to cis women's brains. Um, there's a lot that we don't know at the level of hormonal receptors or the environmental milieu in terms of prenatal hormone exposure and things like that. 
Um, I was actually, for another talk that I, I'll be giving tomorrow, looking at kind of the evidence base, I was reviewing the literature on studies performed on transsexual individuals. So if you'd look up you know, transsexual as the, as the mesh word in um, PubMed, there were 996 articles. So that's not a lot, okay? And of those articles, the majority of them that I, I went through and I looked at, especially the early ones, talked about you know, psychological etiologies and social um, psychological effects and uh, the endocrinologic status of individuals. But you know, the other studies that are looking at a biologic basis um, are still being done, but they're few. And I think part of the challenge has been we're talking about doing research on a population of people who historically have been stigmatized and are difficult to get into research. And at the same time, those of us who are interested in doing this research, frankly, it's been devalued. And it hasn't been until a call um, through the NIH, for example, in last year that they, this last year that they had a summit that talked about the importance of including trans people in research and actually doing research in trans health to better understand and answer some of these questions that you're raising. They haven't been done, so they haven't been described well. <laughs>